Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be doing a quick short series on the DC-3 which was added to Flight Sim in the big anniversary update a little while ago. Now I've been holding off on this one because there's really a lot of really cool things about this plane and I really wanted to kind of take my time and kind of get into the minutia a little bit. Uh, today's video is going to be dedicated to the engine, the systems, and kind of some of the controls and things and a little bit less the operations. So we're going to do that with a later video. So first things first, uh, before you get too carried away with the DC-3, it's important to know that there's actually a couple different variants that they provide us in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, what you want to take a look at here is you're going to notice there's going to have these paints under the libraries page under between retrofit and classic. The real difference between those two is the retrofit version is going to have a built-in GPS and kind of modern autopilot. The classic version is going to have kind of the old school autopilot that's associated with the DC-3. For our purposes, uh, we're going to be concentrating on the old school one, but the new one works exactly the way you'd expect. And there it is, the lovely DC-3, uh, Douglas Commercial uh, version number three here. What a classic, classic airplane. Uh, they made something like 16 thousand of these. All right, Mr. Fuel Truck, this is my thunder. Don't steal it from me. But uh, today, like I said, we're going to be concentrating on sort of the engines, the hydraulics, and sort of the systems and kind of the control layout, more so than the procedures, which we'll deal a little later. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, when you climb in here, uh, the first difficulty most people have is with the seating position. I'm um, not going to lie that um, we used to have one of these at the Air Museum, and I used to climb up in here, and uh, one of the meanest things we ever did to a kid is uh, one of the other docents was walking along, and they said, hey, uh, have you ever seen an airplane wink? And that was my clue when I was hiding in the cockpit to grab one of the controls and go like this, and it made the aileron, of course, do one of those, and the kid freaked out. It was amazing. So um, that being said, uh, the seating position in this DC-3 is a little tricky. Uh, one of the things I recommend doing is if you intended to fly this thing a lot, is to go ahead and change your general seating position into something that's going to be a little bit more useful to you. If you go under cameras, you're going to notice there's these options for things like HUD, SUP, and stuff like that. So you know, I can bring my head down, I can bring my head up. Pick something that is going to be comfortable to you. Otherwise, like I said, you're really, really going to go nuts as far as uh, trying to go ahead and find what you need to be able to see. Uh, another thing that I recommend too is if you have some kind of external instrument, it makes it a lot easier. I actually have an external instrument set up right now, yet you can't see it, but I can see little gauges and things in front of here, so it makes it much easier for me to concentrate on things. But for those of you who are in VR, man, have you got a treat. This thing is so cool. All right, let's talk about this plane. So first things first, uh, this aircraft is pretty conventional. Um, when I say conventional, it has conventional landing gear, it has these classic Pratt & Whitney engines. Uh, one of the reasons we're here in Hartford, by the way, is this engine was manufactured literally right over there. <laughs> so it's just kind of neat when you think about it. Uh, the other thing we need to think about too is it's a classic air-cooled radial engine. It's actually a two-row radial engine. Uh, what that means is there's a lot of extra stuff and uh, buttons and switches that we have to kind of pay attention to during our flight. So my first stop in our little journey to making this thing work, let me go and hide this so uh, we don't have to stare at it too, too much. Hey, Mr. Controller, you're in my way. You're blocking my view here. Hey, move. I hate it when I can't quite get the click spot for the controller. Yeah, by the way, having a button where you can move your head around is super helpful. Oh, well, kind of just have to live with it. All right, let's head over here. So first things first is uh, we have a set of different instrument instrument gauges uh, that are going to be kind of critical for us for the maintenance of this engine. Uh, starting over here on our left, uh, we're going to go and reach over here. We have our manifold pressure, which is a measurement of how open our throttle is. Now, this particular aircraft is equipped with a supercharger on board. And what a supercharger does is it basically forces more air into the cylinders than would otherwise be possible, especially when we get up to altitude. What you're probably going to notice is uh, 30 inches here, or at least 29.92, is about the highest air pressure you could possibly get just at sea level. Keep in mind, obviously, if you have a high pressure day, it could be closer to 31. If you have a low pressure day, please don't be down here. This is a hurricane pressure. The reason we care about this is there's a maximum limit on how much air we can jam into those engines. And there's actually two separate limits in this aircraft. Um, the first limit is going to be, of course, the uh, maximum limit. This is our takeoff. This is limited typically to two or five minutes, depending on the orientation. The second limit we're going to have is what they call Mito power, which is maximum except takeoff power. That's going to be a power setting where we can maintain this if we need to to like do a quick climb. And of course, this whole green arc here is going to be dedicated to kind of conventional powers. In this particular aircraft, a little blue arc here represents the cruise powers, which is just a little different on this aircraft. Uh, the way we manipulate the manifold pressure is actually twofold. First method, of course, is we have everybody's favorite. The throttle will do that directly. And in the real airplane, we have supercharger control handles. Uh, what you would do with these, of course, is you go ahead and click on those. That would change the gear of the supercharger, getting a pretty substantial increase in power at altitude. But as you probably observed, um, 
it's permanently locked into low blower. So the people who model this didn't give us the fancy superchargers. We get just the conventional ones for shame, but it's fine. Next stop here is going to be the revolutions per minute. Remember, these are big, heavy radial engines. These are not little putt-putt continentals or Lycoming things. You know, these are gigantic Pratt & Whitney 1930s air racing trophy kind of winning engines here. So as a result, all the RPMs here are going to be pretty much similar to what you're typically used to. Uh, the important thing in this one is that we actually have a geared engine. Uh, the propeller does not turn at this speed. This is actually the engine RPM. The propeller is about half the speed. I can't remember the gear ratio at all. The important thing here is it's the exact same thing as it was over here. So if we ever try to pick a power setting that is both in the green, if we were in the green for both of these, these would be kind of our climb settings. If we were in the blue for both of these, these would be our acceptable, um, basically going to be our cruise settings for this particular aircraft. So even if we don't know exactly what we're supposed to be, we know at takeoff, we can do the red line. We know at climb, we can do the top of the green line, and that's going to work pretty well for us. To control the RPM in this particular aircraft, uh, relatively straightforward, we have this lovely, lovely little instrument down here. This is our propeller handle. These are a lot smaller in the real world. Like this thing looks like it's like a foot wide. It isn't. It's like this little tiny like, golf ball kind of basically in your hand. Moving on from there, we have our oil pressure gauge. Obviously, this is going to be a very, very important measure of how smoothly the oil is moving around. Obviously, if it gets hotter, your oil pressure is going to decrease. If you're leaking oil, your oil pressure is going to decrease. If it is a very cold day, it is going to spike. And obviously, you don't want to be running your engines hard when uh, it's a very, very cold day and you haven't had enough time to kind of let that oil really circulate and kind of thin out. Remember, these are radial engines. So uh, those lovely, lovely, let me float out back real quickly here. Those engines down there, there's a big pool of oil at the bottom of them as everything slowly drains. So it's really, really important for us in the real world more so than anything to make sure that this is correct. To the side of that, we have our fuel pressure gauge. Um, the, one of the interesting things is in flight sim, this is a very, very polite fuel pressure gauge. In the real world, it like goes spikes and it stays here forever, and then you don't touch the throttle, and all of a sudden it drops. It's, it's a mess, but basically it's going to measure how aggressive the fuel is coming out of the tanks up until the front of where the carburetor is. Speaking of the carburetor, you probably noticed these three little handles here. These are carburetor heat handles, but we're going to get to those in a minute. Don't stress too much. Next stop, I want to go ahead and stop by these three temperature gauges. Actually, not three. One, one, yeah, they're all temperature gauges. First one's going to be oil temperature. Now, remember when I said that your oil pressure is slightly dependent on how hot the oil is? Well, this is a measurement of how hot the oil is. As you can see right now, we've got no heat at all. This is a very, very cold oil right now. So and the idea here is we're really not supposed to run those engines hard until we're in the green for these two settings, meaning the oil is moving around properly in our engine. To the right of this, uh, by the way, the best way to control this, you just got to let it cook. Uh, we also have cow flaps. We'll look at that in a second. To the right of that, of course, we have the cylinder temperature gauge. So this is a temperature gauge. Think of this as like your water temperature in you know, some old cars. Now, what you're going to notice is there's a really wide green arc here. Uh, realistically, we're not supposed to be using full power below it. And if we're excessive of it, you could probably do some massive damage to the cylinders themselves. On this aircraft, we have conventional cow flaps. So if you move your head over to the right, you're going to see these two cow flap controls. The way this works is pretty straightforward. We have shut it off, we have the trail position, and then we have the full open position. Now, if I crank both of those, of course, we have no electrical power. They shouldn't do anything. Let me go outside real quickly here. Uh, let's see. They should not be moving. Good. See how they're totally closed here? Let's get ourselves a little bit of electrical power to show you what's going to happen here. Click. Thank you. And those things should snap open. Uh, you're going to see the little panels here. I've got to slowly rat and kind of open their mouths wide as they start letting. Ah. There it goes. Nice. Okay, so that cow flap there would give you the ability to go ahead and control the temperature of your engines. Go ahead and shut everybody off here. That's perfectly fine. I'm not stressing about it. Now, the reason these are important is during any sort of ground operations, you're probably going to have them open all the way. Uh, once you get your aircraft up in the air, it's uh, pretty typical to flip them over to trail. Of course, uh, when you're in a cruise position, you can go between close and off, and obviously you need to keep kind of a close eye on them. In the real world, your engine temperatures are never really going to be the same, so it's not unlikely to fly something like this uh, as you're kind of cruising around. Big thing here, if you're looking for a rule of thumb, keep them open when you're in high power, keep them closed when you're cruising, and that's kind of the safest way to sort of approach it. Last but not least, we have this thing. This is carburetor air temperature. Now, um, I find this a little misleading right now because it currently is saying that my carburetor air temperature is uh, ho, 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 uh, getting close to boiling, which is very unlikely given that it's a 15 degrees Celsius day. But what this is going to do is this is going to tell you the likelihood of getting ice inside your carburetors. Now, if you remember a little while ago, I was mentioning the fact that we have these carburetor heat handles. You actually have two. You have a one for the left carburetor and you have one for the right carburetor. By the right carburetor, I mean the one on the left side of the plane, the one on the right. Or let's be even more specific, engine one, engine two, port, starboard, 
nice. Uh, the reason this is important is because if you get into a temperature situation where there's visible moisture and your temperature is in the critical zone here, which would be usually around between, I think it's about minus 10 to positive 10, at least that's what they taught us in flight school, um, you have the chance of getting ice inside your carburetors, which will block the flow of air into your engines. Uh, if this occurs, of course, um, <laughs> you're going to have a much shorter flight than intended. The good news is we have carburetor heat, which we can use, but even better news is if you float your head up here, there's actually a carburetor de-icing system switch, which uh, I don't know if the original DC3 had this or this is a retrofit, but it's pretty sweet because I can flip that on. Obviously, nothing should happen right now because we have no electrical power, but what this will do is this will automatically attempt to keep the carburetor temperature in the green arc. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, why don't I just uh, flip the two carburetor heat levers and just leave them on at all times? Well, the problem is you're forcing warm air into the engine, which is actually going to give you a reduction in power. Not to mention, in the real world at least, uh, when you have your carburetor uh, heat on, you're also usually skipping your air filter, which on the ground can be really, really, really bad. Last thing we want to take a look at uh, while we're cruising around down here is going to be our fuel instrument, our fuel gauge here. Now we have uh, four different fuel tanks on this aircraft. And now notice when I clip this, you're actually moving a little piece of paper in the back. And of course, uh, we don't have electrical power. Let's go get some. There we go. I'm just going to push that button cheat this time. There we go. Should make a bunch of angry noises for us. There we go. You can now see the different fuel tanks that I have on board. Now, the interesting thing with the fuel tanks is if I turn my head down, you actually have a handy dandy switch for the purposes of adjusting your fuel settings. Uh, right now, you can see my fuel is set to off. If I want to burn out of the aux tank, I could swing over to that one. If I want to burn out of the left aux tank, I go here. Now, notice we have the ability to cross feed. So I could do right tank and I could do left tank, which my brain is, what are you doing? Stop. <laughs> it's not to say that you can't do it. As a matter of fact, what makes it really interesting, I'm going to go do the best I can with my sticky head here. Uh, floating down here, you'll actually notice that there is a, supposed to be a cross-feed switch here that would enable us to do that, but we don't actually have access to it, which is kind of a bummer. All right, so the next thing we're going to take a look at, uh, now that we've got a little bit of noise going on, I'm actually going to secure the aircraft and pop that button real quickly, is our hydraulic system. Now, our hydraulic system on this... Ah, I found the button! I found it! Uh, the hydraulic pressure button is basically, or hydraulic, is going to give us the ability to know how much pressure. This aircraft requires hydraulic pressure for different purposes. Uh, the big one, of course, is uh, flaps, and the other one, of course, is landing gear. You're going to notice that we have two separate hydraulic gauges here. We have one for the landing gear themselves, and we have one for the entire hydraulic system as it is. Now, the reason that's interesting on this aircraft versus a lot of aircraft like it is if I flip my head over here, you're going to notice there's a bunch of funky handles here. You'll notice one here allows me to select what hydraulic pump I'm operating off and which one I'm sending it to. In this case, if I pull it that way, you can set it to a different position. The other one, of course, if we float my head down a little bit, it gives you to go ahead and say where you can shut off the hydraulic fluid. Then you have this giant handle, which of course would be for selecting the flap handle. And this is how you could basically open the hydraulic valve to open and close the flap. <laughs> so you pop it out and you'd actually push it and push it in order to control the position of the flaps. Of course, we have absolutely no um, oil, um, should say, um, hydraulic pressure right now, so none of that's going to do anything for us. It's just kind of wild that it's uh, kind of old school in that sort of a sense. Then our last one, of course, uh, which is the one I'm not going to be able to get to very handy here, would be the one for the gear lever. And that, of course, actually, it's our manual hydraulic pump. But otherwise, you can also set your gear down and up by basically controlling that flap lever, as you just heard with that angry lever right there, by adjusting that directly to literally push the pressure of the hydraulic fluid around as you're handling those at the same time. Talk about old fashioned, but it's just important to know that when you do have all these handles and when you start kind of playing around with them like I got here, this is normally how you would set that. So let's go ahead and get some engine power going real quickly here. Uh, one of the cool things is they're nice enough to give us a switch. Push that, uh, the thing makes a ton of noise. That sound wonderful. <laughs> Love that. There we go. And now you can watch that the hydraulic pressure is uh, starting to come up directly. And of course, uh, now that we have hydraulic pressure, we have the ability to do all sorts of fun things like put the flaps up and down. Like you'll notice uh, right now, the current position of the flaps is in that. I'm gonna go ahead and give that a little tug. You can see I can dial exactly what I need it to do and set the pump exactly the way I want. So I can go set them down, I can go set them up, I can do anything that I need for that particular system. Now normally what you do of course is uh, when you're ready to kind of start cruising around and everything along those lines, you could actually come over here and you could shut the system off except for when you actually need it. Like I said, I've got yourself, I love how it's got the little landing gear, we've got the manual pressure pump. 
Now, if you're ever curious, uh, if you actually come float up here, it actually gives you a list of how much uh, hydraulic pressure you have right now. And it'll even give you general warnings of like, you know, when you have this amount, oh, you have to refill it if it goes below this line, everything along those lines. Um, now that we've got the engines uh, rolling there, let's actually get everybody out cooling off real quickly so I can show you a couple more things about the systems. That's all set. You can see now that we're rolling up here, uh, you've got oil temperature. The oil pressure is very, very low. You can see the oil temperature is coming up. And you can see the cylinder head temperatures warm up very, very quickly. And for some reason, our carburetor heat is still very warm. I wonder if this is uh, something else that I did earlier that I missed. But the important thing is you can see how all these systems are starting to come together. Now, one last thing we want to go ahead and take a look at. I'm going to go ahead and unclick the switch because we don't need it or anything like that. And that's uh, when you come up here, you're going to notice two switches for booster pumps. Now, on this particular aircraft that we have, these are fuel switch pumps. The engines themselves do have an engine-driven fuel pump. But in the event that we need to give them a little bit of a push, we can actually hit that switch to kind of help them out. Uh, this is very, very important to use uh, during things like starting. It's very, very important to use during takeoff and climb. And you can see the moment that I kill it, our pressure dies pretty aggressively. It's not to say that the engine is going to suddenly die on us or anything like that. It's just really, really important that we consider that when we're doing our takeoffs in the event that we did lose our engine driven pump, that we have the ability to snap that on just like that to go ahead and get us going. So that concludes our little uh, kind of introduction of the uh, DC-3 here. Like I said, absolutely a neat, neat airplane. Uh, next time we'll go into the uh, kind of particulars of takeoff. Uh, we'll also get into uh, kind of getting this thing started up, warming up. We'll look at a little bit of navigation, and then we'll uh, do one final video dedicated to getting this thing back on the ground and shutting it down. Enjoy.